the main um, overarching umbrella question that we were asking was, how can we use this intensive period of intervention to help us learn more about how children learn? When children are learning, does that precede brain development or does brain development precede learning? That's this episode's guest, Patrick Donnelly, a PhD candidate and researcher at the University of Washington. Welcome to Linda Mood Bell Radio, a podcast on all things literacy and learning. I'm Dave Hungerford for Linda Mood Bell, and we believe that every individual can learn to read and comprehend to their potential. Every student should go to a school where they're sure to thrive. Linda Mood Bell Academy, a private K-12 school, combines individualized instruction with accredited curriculum. Students can attend online, in person, or a combination of both. The learning needs of each child are addressed so they're ready to learn, and they do. Visit lindamoodbellacademy.com and reach out to our admissions team to get started. I met Patrick when he visited Lindamood Bell's headquarters to present his research at a webinar for our staff. Here's our conversation. Today I'm here with Patrick Donnelly, a graduate student at the University of Washington, and I just finished listening to a talk that he gave at Lindamood Bell uh, regarding some of his reading research that he's accomplished and just finished a, uh, a publication that uh, we'll get into a little bit, but I want to welcome you to Lindamood Bell Radio. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, Patrick, tell me a little bit about your, your journey. You're almost a, uh, you're a PhC, which is a candidate for your doctoral degree. Uh, tell me about your, your journey to get to where you are today. Yes, absolutely. So I am from Arizona, but my first exposure to reading, um, to reading research was um, during my undergraduate degree at Tufts, where I had the opportunity to work with Marianne Wolf in her lab. And I had entered university as um, an international relations and Spanish major. But I took her intro to child development course and was really immediately enamored by her work and research on reading. And it was really for two main reasons in that I was interested in science and I was interested in learning, interested in learning and development. And reading really presents a super cool scientific question. It combines hearing and language and speech in in a way that um, for at least a typical reader performs flawlessly at um, a rate that people don't, no longer have to pay attention to what they're doing. They just do it because it's instinctual. And secondly, reading, um, especially for me growing up, um, was an escape um, into the imagination. It was... Um, Listening to audiobooks with my family or having my parents read to me was always is um, always some of my most, most poignant memories. And so, for a child who struggles reading, um, it's quite debilitating not only for for their participation in school, but their ability to to do what reading enables them to do, which is escape the world and learn about others' experiences, put themselves in other people's shoes, and, and such like that. So I um, worked with her there. And then I moved um, across the country to Seattle to work at the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences, where I had the opportunity to meet Jason Yateman. And his work really intrigued me because he was asking some of the same questions, but in, in a different way, to see whether or not we could see evidence of this network, this reading network, in these struggling readers, and um, look at quantitative metrics of brain matter to see how we could cater interventions and look at predictors and see um, w- how much we can learn about this disorder beyond what we already do. And, that's and I, I want to find out about that lab and some of the uh, the tools that you use. I know it's a very uh, complex and sophisticated place. But you mentioned something, you know, when we talk about reading, really what we in general hear about are reading failures. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's kind of the media, that's the news. We have state tests everywhere, and what's reported, and the shocking thing is how little growth has been made over the past four, five, six decades uh, of reading instruction, even though there's been some attention to it. Right. Why, why do you think that is? Um, 
And what is it about reading that, that makes it so, so difficult? I think one of the biggest struggles for reading instruction is that, um, ironically, we also don't really understand how we learn language, but for those who teach reading and for parents of struggling readers, they don't themselves remember how arduous the process was of learning how to read. It happens when we're so young, and for the typical reader, it happens so quickly that we don't necessarily understand how those foundational building blocks of literacy came together to enable us to do what we do when we approach a, a page of text. And in that way, it makes, it makes it really hard to, um, to teach. But I think one of the biggest impediments in what we're seeing in, in declining rates of literacy is that the instruction that kids are receiving in the school is not enough and it's not sufficient. You had an interesting quote from uh, Steven Pinker, maybe you could repeat from your talk. Yeah, I, um, in drawing a distinction between language and literacy, Steven Pinker talks about how language is something that develops instinctually. It's, um, it's wired, pre-wired, but literacy is painstakingly bolted on through practice and iteration and instruction. And it's kind of an artificial construct that we just... It's a cultural phenomenon, yeah. We, yeah. Well, let's talk about the lab at, at uh, Washington. Uh, I've been there. It has uh, a beautiful MRI machine in there. It's got a lot of other machinery. Uh, tell me about your first experience when you were kind of brought into the group that, that does work there. Um, well, I was brought in um, to work on a project that Dr. Yeatman was working on in creating these outreach modules. iLabs um, Institute for Winning and Brain Sciences is really committed to to communicating the results of research to those who are on the ground and able to um, to action upon it. Um, and so I was working with him on creating a couple of modules on reading development, and sort of synthesizing research on what we know and communicate in a way that makes sense and is actionable to people who work with children. And then um, the first research project I actually started working on was this collaboration with Lindy Mood Bell, um, where he uh, had the interest and he was eager to start, but he needed help in um, running the project. And I, who had experience working in research and had uh, known how to um, deliver the assessments that we were going to use and uh, could organize and run the study. Uh, we uh, teamed up and decided to tackle it head on as a lab of two. Great. Well, let's, let's kind of go through the nuts and bolts of that. You, um, it's had now several publications result from it uh, in a kind of a wide range of metrics that you've looked at from uh, defense, the, DTI to um, just measures, behavioral measures of reading. Um, can you give me an idea of what the, the overall scope of the project was, if you would? Right. Um, certainly ambitious project, and we tried to collect as much data as we could in the time frame that we had so that we could not look back and say, oh, I wish that we would have done this, um, which is something we, can't, we don't have to say is because we collected it all. And um, now the challenge is analyzing it. Um, but the main um, overarching umbrella question that we were asking was, how can we use this intensive period of intervention to help us learn more about how children learn and ask questions that have um, been on the tip of the tongue of researchers for a long time about, well, when children are learning, does that proceed brain development or does brain development precede learning? Um, questions such as, oh, what at what time scale do different reading measures grow? Do they all grow in concert or do some grow faster than others? Um, how long does it take to see changes in some of the more um, generalizable skills like reading comprehension and fluency as opposed to um, foundational skills such as phon uh, phonological awareness and decoding? So what, what type of students did you target? What we kids? wanted to target those kids who struggle reading, either because they have a diagnosis of dyslexia or because they have characteristics that are similar 
um, to, to dyslexia without a diagnosis. And how'd you go about recruiting students? Um, well, I took advantage of the fact that parents and families of struggling readers are always looking for information. And so I looked at parent groups on Facebook and online, and I talked to parent teacher associations. And there's a school in Seattle that um, works specifically with kids with reading disabilities that I reached out to. And um, I published flyers in libraries and clinics and grocery stores. A lot of legwork. A lot Sounds of legwork. Like. But now we have a substantial database of, of participants in the Seattle area with reading issues that I um, can pull from whenever I need to. And for this particular study, how many students did you end up with? There were 31 kids who were enrolled in the intervention. And then I had an additional um, 11 who participated as control participants. So they had the same, uh, statistically the same test scores as the, the experimental students, yes. and they just did not receive the instruction during the same time. Yeah. Right. And tell me a little bit about the measures you used uh, initially to, to group these students. Well, we use measures that are, are used by other research groups and have been used in the past um, to characterize reading ability. Um, standardized measures that are norm reference, which means we're looking at how these kids perform in relation to other kids their age. And so we specifically collected measures of decoding and reading fluency and comprehension to show that these kids were performing below the normal population. Um, and specifically below one, one standard deviation, which means uh, that they're performing at about the 30th percentile or less. And these are tests that are, they sit down with somebody and they'll have them read a list of, of words and that person scores how many words they yep. get correctly. They mm -hmm. read nonsense words yep. to measure how well they can decode or read something they've not seen before. Yep. What, are the, what were the other measures that you... Was it? There's a reading fluency measure where we give them a passage. In this case, it's either about bees, trees, or whales. And they um, read the passage, and the, the score scores whether or not they read it accurately. Um, for that measure, it's really important. We don't ask them to read for meaning at all. We just ask them to read as accurately as possible. And then our comprehension measure we have is a sentence reading fluency measure where they read short sentences and decide if they're true or false and make that judgment. And you also included uh, some measures of from IQ, published yep. IQ tests as well, right? Yes. Um, it's an established norm in the field to collect measures of IQ just to see how their reading abilities compare to their um, quote unquote general cognitive abilities. So it's fair to say that you're kind of deconstructing reading as a whole into some really specific, yeah. measurable skills that these students had to perform. Mm -hmm. You're going to have some get instruction, some not. Uh, tell us what the instruction period was and the, the timing on that, how you set that up. Yeah, the instruction period happened over two summers, 2016 and 2017. And um, it was 160 hours of seeing stars uh, delivered for these kids. Um, the first summer was at three different learning centers in the Seattle area, Seattle, Tacoma, and Bellevue. And then in the second summer, we hosted the uh, Linda Mood Bell trained teachers at our department on the Seattle campus and to create a sort of reading clinic. And being that it's a fairly complex program, you had Linda Mood Bell staff doing the actual instruction in yes. the hope that it would make it consistent teacher to teacher. Yes. Great. And you also... What were the, uh, the scanning processes along? I know you did the behavioral test, the reading test. What were the scanning processes that were involved? Yeah, so for the four time points over the intervention, before, after, and twice in the middle, we had them not only do their reading assessments to gauge their reading growth over the period, but we also had them um, uh, do an MRI session, magnetic resonance imaging, and also a magnetoencephalography session as well. Um, and those both were about an hour and um, were used to um, quantify different um, measures of growth in the, the networks 
of reading in the brains of these kids. Well, I can picture a kid getting in the, the sliding thing, going into the magnet, yep. and they look up at a mirror that's reflecting to a screen, I think. Yep. What, what are the tasks that they do when they're having their brain scanned? Well, the beauty of the, the diffusion metrics that we collected where we're looking at structure and we're looking at how these, um, how these networks are, are built and how they grow is that we don't actually need them to do any reading task. So we just had them watch a movie and they got to pick whatever movie they wanted as long as they didn't laugh too much. Because you can't move too yeah. much because it'll ruin the images. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. And so what then is measured as they're watching that movie in the particular in the brain in specific um the, the what we're capturing is um the uh, the rate of water diffusion dr gateman can speak more to this because uh, he's the lead on that project but what we're measuring is how um these networks in the brain how efficiently they work and the way that uh, a network increases efficiency efficiency is through a process of myelination where the axons in these connections connections create these myelin sheaths, these um, insulated um, areas so that um, information can more efficiently pass between them. So it's a complex way of measuring brain activity. And I know the traditional fMRI measures like the iron in the blood flow, and this is yep. measuring the water in the white matter. Yes. So, so what, were the, what were the results? So what we found is that um, the kids, uh, of course, did respond really well to the intervention program, and they, their reading measures grew across the board. Um, and what we were interested in, in particular was their rate of growth, whether or not there was a linear growth, or whether or not perhaps we could better explain their growth through a, a higher order polynomial, like a quadratic effect, where um, from point A to point B, they may not grow um, one to one, but they may like uh, have a slower rate of growth at the beginning and then accelerate towards the end, or they may have a rapid period of growth at the beginning and then sort of plateau. Um, and what we found is for this study and these participants in this time frame, the best model to describe their growth was a linear model, um, which suggests a dose-response relationship between hours of intervention and reading growth, where we could reasonably say that the amount that you invest in a child's reading um, and learning is the amount that you're going to gain in the end. So their gain was fairly consistent over the, the periods that you measured for these for, students? For this particular, particular sample and time period, yes. Right. Given the limitations of the study, I understand that. I, did you have any expectations prior to that? I would have personally thought that maybe there's a, uh, a the negative quadratic where they're bogged down at first, then all of a sudden something clicks and they accelerate their growth towards the end, but that did not seem to be the case for these. Kids. Um, I have to say I expected that as well, but I did expect um, a sort of a more positive quadratic for our foundational skills. I expected the, the decoding measures to grow really rapidly and to, to plateau. And I um, and what we did see was that it was it was a little bit more it was more linear for all measures. And I think that if we were to extend to more hours of intervention, we might start to see um, quadratic effects of the nature for all measures in our, in our that, that said, though, uh, practically and logistically speaking, having students for 160 hours yep. uh, is a pretty good achievement. <laughs> it certainly is. It's the, um, to my knowledge, it, it's the most intensive intervention that um, has been delivered. What we also found, um, another main finding that wasn't published, um, was when we were looking at individual differences and we were saying, okay, what is it about certain kids that made them benefit or, or not? Um, we looked at um, many of the measures that are used in, in the literature, such as phonological awareness and rapid autonomized naming and IQ and age and starting reading ability. We looked at whether or not, whether or not those had an impact and we found that age and rapid naming and phonological awareness didn't predict who would succeed and who would not. But we did find that IQ and reading ability did, and in a way that we didn't necessarily expect. It was those readers who were most impaired and those that had the lowest IQ who benefited most from their participation in the program. And so several years it took you to 
to complete this, tell me about the publication process. Oh, it was a roller coaster. Um, I submitted it initially in January of 2018, and it did not succeed in two journals that it was submitted to. And this final journal, Frontiers in Psychology, I submitted to um, at the beginning of this year um, in March. And it took a while for them to find and match it with reviewers. And then it was published in August. So, In? In Frontiers in Psychology. Frontiers in Psychology. I, I think it's always good to reiterate the, the level of scientific review that, that each piece has. But it, if it makes it to publication, it's a big deal. Right. I mean, there are how many, how many reviewers that, that are, they see this blind. Yep. And there are people that are established in the field. Right. And they go through the process, and mm -hmm. do they come back to you with more questions typically? Do they want to review some of your data? Do you submit your data? Um, so there's there's three responses you can get from reviewers. You can either get a um, revise and resubmit, which means they have questions, but they feel that they can be addressed. Um, or you get a um, reject, where they just give you your reviews and say that they didn't de de they didn't think it was possible for you to address the questions in a way in this particular um, manuscript for you to 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 publish, and then the third is that they, which is rare, is that they accept without revision. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, the first um, two submissions I had were um, rejections without review, but we did incorporate many of the much of the feedback that we did receive from reviewers. And many other reviewers had issues with um, our control group comparison and um, the ability for us to, to demonstrate that these kids grew over the course of intervention. And what, um, what you can uh, read when, if you read our paper is that we make it abundantly clear that what we're not testing is whether or not this intervention is effective. And that it requires a different methodology one that we couldn't capture in this specific study because we did not have an active control comparison group. Our control group had business as usual or no intervention. And so um, we never wanted to, to have an efficacy, efficacy study from the beginning um, because we wanted to use this intervention as a, a way to demonstrate learning. And so um, we didn't feel it was necessary to determine which aspects in particular of the intervention were effective, but use it as sort of a, um, a vehicle to fuel our growth and knowledge about literacy and learning. Hmm. And this is, I think I said earlier, the fourth publication from, derived from this study. Are there others in the works? Um, there's one related to the magnetoencephalography data, which is still pending, uh, but I believe that's going to be submitted soon. And how about for you? What's what's next on your your plate? So my um, the the rest of my research, which should take me about another year at UW, is dealing with educational technologies for literacy. I am very interested in how technology is incorporated into literacy learning, and how we can best leverage those aspects of technology which can benefit um, kids and families who struggle reading. Um, there have been a lot of apps and and tools made, some that are um, well evidence-based and others, and majority of which, which are not, are not studied. And I think it's a promising avenue given uh, current trends for how education should, um, how education is moving and what it's moving towards. And I think it's um, the impetus for reading researchers to get involved in that development process. Um, There's a lot out there that are trying to replace the teacher. And that's not the way that I think it's the most fruitful. And there are many constructive ways that technology can be incorporated. We have, over the past probably five or six years, incorporated just a lot of more teleconference and telepresence instruction mm -hmm. to be able to serve students from Laos, mm -hmm. uh, parts of the United States and the world that don't have access to any of our learning centers. And that mm -hmm. seems to be very promising. It's not a separate app, but it right. is just a way to communicate with the technology and make, make sure that instruction is uh, consistent with what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you for joining me. Um, we look forward to reading about your uh, upcoming work and congratulations on an upcoming graduation or conferment of your, your doctorate. And yeah. uh, thanks for joining us here in Linwood Bell.
Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to collaborate with you on this project. And thank you for listening. Learn more about the research, which at this point has resulted in four peer-reviewed publications on the Linda Mood Bell webpage, lindamoodbell.com, and you can see a video of participants talking about their experiences on our YouTube page. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are Linda Mood Bell. <laughs>